so um, the topics um, uh, for this panel discussion, uh, this is going to be really on uh, AI guided image acquisition, image and signal acquisition. We just heard about the home use and uh, the importance of that. So I want to get started with that. Um, uh, we started, uh, we heard from the patients, uh, but also we heard uh, uh, from uh, the experts, uh, developers on home use. So, oh, by the way, before I should, uh, before I go on, I have just remembered that uh, let's go through the uh, panel members, everybody, if you could uh, please introduce yourselves. I'm John Martin, I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Butterfly Network. I'm Randy King, I'm a Program Officer at NIBIB, part of NIH. My name is Ha Hong uh, from Captain Health. Rob Troms, I'm Strategic Architect for AI for Philips Ultrasound. Mike Washburn, Chief Engineer with GE Healthcare. Brian Kara, FTA. Helen Feltovich. Is it not working? It was working. Helen Feltovich, um, maternal fetal medicine doctor with Intermountain Healthcare and researcher with University of Wisconsin. Um, Richard Frank, Chief Medical Officer of Siemens Health and Ears and a representative of the Medical Imaging Technology Alliance. Anthony Samir, physician scientist and radiologist at the Mass General Hospital. Perus Chavistari, Acting Division Director of Bioinformatics Division at NIBIP. Jean Lisbeth, Sonographer and Director of Perinatal Quality Foundation. Isabella O'Brien, cardiology patient. Amy O'Brien, caregiver. Hopefully, no. Uh, Harsh Thacker. Josh Basil, founder of Determined to Heal and Spinal PD and trial attorney. Thank you very much, folks. So, as I mentioned, uh, the first topic is the topic of home use of uh, AI guided uh, image acquisition uh, systems. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Martin, you talked so passionately about uh, home use, so I'd like to start with you and ask about uh, maybe addressing the first two uh, subtopics in this area. What type of impact on the risk-benefit analysis could be expected for such devices, and what approaches are acceptable for patient consent? I'll do the patient consent one first because that's the easiest and I have the most experience with because as a surgeon, you live your life doing patient consent. And so I, I look at this exactly the same way whenever we either um, institute care, whether it's a drug, whether it's a device or whether this at home, I think you have the same kind of com conversations with the patient and their caregivers of the risk benefits of what we're trying to achieve. So I don't really see this as anything different than what we typically already do as a physician in healthcare. Now, as the first one, the risk-benefit analysis, so we've, we've set a standard for ourselves. We would like the imaging to match the quality as if someone was at a hospital and a professional is performing that. We think that that's a fair standard. Um, I think, candidly, we've had speakers at the end of the room tell you about the benefits of this, and they're overwhelming. I mean, no one really wants to engage the healthcare system unless they absolutely have to have it. And so whether it's improved patient satisfaction, the efficiency in the delivery of care, the reduced cost, the improved quality, and ultimately better outcomes, I think these are all measures that go into this. And so as we balance, um, if we can have this similar efficacy and safety, all the benefits trump everything else by far and moving into the home i think is something we should do expeditiously and thank you for making the case thank you very much um dr samir your thoughts i think um that um very much as john had mentioned i tend to agree the the benefits are are there um there are risks that I foresee too, um, primarily around uh, overuse of technology and diagnosis in circumstances where diagnosis is unhelpful. Um, and I think that part of the organizational and regulatory framework that will go into the effective and responsible deployment of these devices uh, should include mechanisms to mitigate those risks um, so that we're not so overcome by our own enthusiasm um, that we forget that technology is often um, a benefit and a risk. Um, having, having said that, um, I share everyone's enthusiasm absolutely. I can't wait till these tools are in the hands of patients and I 
hope that all of us will be able to be part of that journey and make it happen as quickly as possible. Thank you very much. Um, in the interest of time, I, my apologies for kind of going fast through this, but uh, I uh, would like to uh, move uh, on and uh, address the next two topics. How should the physician be involved? Should they be the trainers and prescribers? And what type of image quality uh, standards be, should be applied for such systems? Dr. Feltovich, you talked about this, and uh, I would like to start with you, please. Sure, thank you. Well, I, I actually really liked what Isabella said about how um, she wanted to be able to talk to a person if necessary. And as I think I discussed a few minutes ago, I'm a big believer in AI. I, I do think there are some risks involved with diagnosis and that, but I'm a big believer in it and I have a lot of hope for it. But I think at the end of the day that a physician does need to be involved for Isabella, 24 hours a day, for Harsh and Josh, 24 hours a day, for all of us, when, for our conditions, um, so that we feel like we have a connection and a person to talk to and a person to explain things to. And this ties into, you know, the risk of technology, just fundamentally, which is that um, you can get all kinds of information and not all of it is clinically meaningful. Ms. Spitz, you have some thoughts on this? Uh, you talked about your training program. I would agree. I think um, I look forward to um, the time when ultrasound images can be cleaned up by AI so that the risk of, of misinterpretation is decreased. Um, you know, I've seen people who are not very well trained uh, create artifactual problems. Um, so there, are, there is a risk, but it, I have great hope in AI as well. Thank you. Um, again, in the interest of time, let's uh, move uh, forward. Uh, but how open is the community uh, to adding diagnosis to image acquisition? And uh, what should the patient interaction be uh, with physicians? Uh, how should uh, scenarios with where diagnostic evaluation is involved uh, be handled? So if I may start, uh, ask uh, Dr. Frank uh, to comment on this. Well, to reiterate my comment yesterday that um, patient benefit is paramount. Yeah? And we've heard some concerns expressed about context of use and mitigation of risk and so on. It's, it is much more than just the acquisition of the image. Um, and so to add to that uh, diagnostic quality, not just diagnostic quality of the image, but interpretation of the image certainly is a, a bridge beyond that. Uh, industry are open to that, um, but we need to take into account um, things like the context of use, the circumstances, not just the training and, and the acquisition itself. Thank you. And I'd like to ask our uh, patient representatives here, uh, how uh, would you see this uh, patient interaction with the physicians? Um, I think that it's really important because sometimes if you get something, you can get results and not understand what they mean. And sometimes like a machine can try to explain it to you, but everyone like understands things differently and to have an actual person sit down with you and explain to you what you have or what the results say and what that means, I think is really important. And something to add to that, I mean, if Isabella went to get some of these tests done at a place that didn't understand her body and, and her current situation, some of these tests would actually freak people out, and they have. And so I think, you know, that interpretation to me is, is key, um, where, you know, you may get kind of a read that is not normal, well, but it may be totally normal for her. And so I do, I think that's a real tricky, tricky spot um, where you need to have someone who has some kind of a history and perspective. And we've talked about this. I mean, we text our doctors. Um, I think the doctor presence, like you want to be mentally connected with that doctor having this communication. I don't think they have to physically be there. They could be on the phone, video chat, even texting. We've had meaningful dialogue. So it doesn't make a difference. It just means like, are you paying attention to me and these results? 
Wonderful. Josh, you had something. Hello. Um, there's, there's something special to be said about the experience of getting health care and being able to have that interaction with a doctor, a physician, to be able to have a good experience and motivate you next time to do it again. If you have a bad experience and it rubs off on you the wrong way, it scares you away from it. It scares you away from getting the care you need the next time around. So being able to create the better experiences, having the history, having the dialogue, be open, promotes better care, better outcomes, and overall just a better quality of life. Uh, I'm just going to add one thing real quick. We we know these changes aren't going to make like a 360 degree difference. Like it's not going to go from like no access to like complete access. Right. So like at the same time, understanding that this is going to take like stepping stones to get to that avenue of having these open platforms, continuous open platforms, I think is also important to kind of think about. Thank you very much. Please go ahead. Yeah, Shram, I want to make a quick comment. Uh, we have technologies at home already, and I've seen what happens. Um, a person does the uh, examination, let's say blood pressure, they get an abnormal result, they start getting worried, they start taking it more and more often. So you end up getting this overuse, and then they want to talk to somebody about it, and they're told uh, you can talk to somebody in like three weeks. And uh, so what happens is during that interim period, they over they get more and more stressed, they overuse it more and more. And uh, uh, so we need to have immediate access to advise somebody to advise them that they respect to uh, pre prevent this cycle from happening. Wonderful. Yeah, just make one addition. I try as I might to have a relationship with Alexa. It just doesn't work. She, 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 she hasn't been able to read my body language or my level of anxiety along the way. Although she is very helpful at times, I think at the end of the day, we've done this journey before with, with many, many different technologies, and we can all identify horrible case scenarios that can unfold. I think if we responsibly understand that that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow is something better and take a responsible route along the way, I think we're all going to be happy. We all have to accept the fact we're going to trip sometimes and learn from those. But I think this is a journey worth taking, and I don't want to, we got into healthcare, all of us, because we care. We don't want to take that out of this. talk into. Uh, uh, I think the uh, take home message uh, for me, the key is uh, the balance between uh, being enabled to do some of the image acquisition, signal acquisition, and then having that uh, uh, wise, if you will, or that consulting with a, a physician or a healthcare professional. Last time I was uh, in the doctor uh, office, I complained about the fact that instead of looking at me, he was looking at the computer and everything that I was saying, he was just entering into the computer. So that personal touch should never be forgotten. Uh, Okay, so uh, topic two, adaptive technologies for guided acquisition. Uh, what type of strategies are being envisioned for managing device performance and the associated changes as a function of time and software hardware improvements? Um, I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Washburn, and if you could please comment on this. Do we need performance metrics for continuous evaluation of safety and effectiveness of the AI guided acquisition? Yeah, so I think uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, market surveillance over uh, the course of uh, the various presentations. And I think um, that is certainly a key component um, to be able to to look. So, um, and there was also some talk yesterday about the fact that um, having a comparative standard, you know, what is what is the gold standard? How is it done today and how is it measured today? And often there isn't necessarily um, that information. And so I think um, depending on the intended use and the particular problem uh, to be solved will definitely dictate the kind of solution that's needed in this space. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hong, uh, your thoughts about uh, future changes uh, to a device? Uh... <laughs> I think that the problem has remained the same. So um, uh, Richard Feynman, one of you know famous physicists, global laureate, uh, once uh, mentioned uh, his own way of solving problem. Uh, Feynman's problem-solving strategy it has three components. Uh, number one, write down the problem on the paper. Number two, think about the problem really hard. Number three, and solve the problem. <laughs> 
So um, <laughs> there's a point actually, uh, which is to think about the problem really hard. So we all want to solve medical, you know, problems. And it's very important. Oftentimes, you know, engineers get lost in the technical things, but you know, at the end of the day, it's all matters, the medical, the clinical problem we gotta solve. So we gotta find out, we gotta be very, uh, you know, clear about the aim, which problem, which clinical problem we want to solve. And from there, we gotta, you know, derive um, clinical metrics that is causally, you know, you know, related to the clinical problem we want to solve. And then from there, we wanna uh, have engineering metrics which is causally related to the clinical metrics. The link between the two is not always obvious. Um, it can be quite lengthy, um, but um, as close to the link, we can bridge the, between the, the gap between the two, uh, that'll be better. Um, if we have now um, engineering metrics, then we can now start to think about, you know, making some AI models and, you know, some computer, you know, systems um, based on the optimizations. Um, starting from there, you know, um, there now it comes the, 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 the aspect of data. Uh, now, uh, these days, these uh, new computer models are data hungry. They have millions and millions of parameters oftentimes. And because of that, we want to have as much as possible data. But at the same time, uh, quality is also very important. The quality, there is uh, several aspects. Uh, we want to cover as much as possible natural variability, you know, you can encounter in clinical settings. The more coverage, the better. Um, the more patterns you see, the better. Um, it's like human, it's like same as the human. Um, so for example, like covering as much as possible variability from variability from patients, operators, specific um, hardware, even hospital, if you can cover as much as possible data, um, that'll be better. So quantity and quality of the data. So yeah, I think that that has okay, I'm answering your question. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, yeah, uh, well said. I think uh, Dr. Martin also said it, uh, that the problems that we're talking about, how to actually you know, uh, develop new capabilities, uh, test those capabilities, create the metrics for those capabilities, validate in clinical context, get enough samples, uh, statistically, you know, variant samples to solve the problem is really not unique to AI. This is, AI is just the latest technology that we need to apply good problem solving skills and solve the problems as Dr. Hong said. Great, thank you. And uh, may I ask uh, our patient representatives also, um, do you want to know about which version of the software is being used? Do you want to know the performance metrics for the latest version? Or is what the physician says uh, that this is working is going to be satisfactory? Sorry for providing No, no, no. I, I think that's a very interesting question. Um, it kind of goes back from, like, it kind of goes back, no one reads the agreement before they click yes. <laughs> Um, so, so it's kind of one of those, I mean, you would want to know, um, I think the information should be readily available, um, uh, whether that's presented at every case of it, um, can be dependent on what exactly the changes are within that software or hardware. I think open communication, uh, builds trust. So I think that like Harsh said, making the information available but also being able to communicate it in a way that it can be digestible and not just go over someone's head. Um, but it's, that's, that's what I would say about that. Okay, thank you. Um, I would say that it's really important and like that it's available in some way because maybe not everyone wants to know, but if you've been using like a similar device or if you use like a different version that does a similar thing, you kind of want to know what's different and why this one's better than the last one. Like I've had different um, event monitors and they kind of explained, well, why is this one better and why are you using this one now instead of the other one? I think that's really beneficial. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna move on to topic three now, uh, patient and clinician perspectives. Uh, what would be the perception of patients and clinicians regarding the impact of AI-guided uh, acquisition on workflow enhancement? Is the impact uh, welcomed? What metrics should be used to evaluate the impact? Um, perhaps we could start with uh, uh, Dr. Feltovich, please. Thank you. Um, well, I, I think that 
obviously I'm very open to it and um, really excited for AI. I think this could um, markedly change our workflow so that we have more time to talk to the patient. The story you said a few minutes ago about how the doctor was at the computer instead of looking at you, I think that's happening more and more. And it's really tragic because the one thing that we bring as humans to each other is connection. And, um, and as we just heard from our patient representatives down here, that's critical. Um, but I think that, you know, I had that slide that said AI is monster or goddess. Yeah, I think there actually is a lot of resistance in the medical community because of fear that our jobs will be replaced <laughs> if we are primary imagers. So I think the um, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. I think that you, we cannot replace the human component. I mean, actually, uh, I don't know. Maybe humans can be. Well, I mean, humans, maybe computers can be more empathetic than humans someday. I mean, who who knows what's going to happen? Who thought we'd have Alexas, you know, even 20 years ago, who thought that could happen? So so who knows? But I think that, you know, again, to answer your question, um, there's a lot of resistance, but I think there's also a lot of hope for making things easier and better for us so that we can all get what we want, which is for the provider to be able to interact and for the patients to be able to interact with us and connect. Well, thank you. Any other thoughts here? Can I say one more thing about metrics up there, what metrics should be used? Um, one thing that occurred to me when Brian was saying the thing about people take their blood pressure over and over and get more and more anxious, I think one thing that we need to be aware of around this introduction of AI into our homes and clinics is um, sort of the mental health aspect of that. That's something we haven't talked about at all, but it just occurred to me when he said something about the amazing anxiety, you know, and, and if, if a machine tells you that something is wrong or a machine tells you that something is right, like with that heart case I showed, you could go down, you know, as a patient, you could go down an entirely wrong pathway. So maybe we need to think about some mental health services around this. I'll come to you. Go ahead. So it's been mentioned multiple times, uh, both yesterday and today. I think uh, Dr. Falchich is correct. It's about how the clinician is spending their energy. And it was basically using the analogy of, of the pilot and the plane, right? You know, you can spend a lot of time with the tedious nobology of the device, or you can spend time with the patient, right? And it's really about, I think that's the promise of AI is to allow to, you know, really allow the clinician to focus their energy more to the patient. Yeah, I just want to kind of add another perspective here um, with regards to quality metrics. It's like we love our doctors. And I mean, I mean, they're a part of our family. We've known them for ages. And we always talk about kind of the quality of life for patients. I'm incredibly concerned about the quality of life for all the caregivers. The hours of work, the frustration and stress trying to get good information is outrageous with regards to the impact that it has on the people who care for us. We need their brains to be working. We need them to have wellness. We need them to be healthy in order for them to be solving more complex problems. And so I do think that we need to think about that other perspective of how do we actually help everyone in this ecosystem have a quality of life in order to make it much more productive. Yeah, I, I look at these devices. I want, the, I want the machine and the artificial intelligence to help me make a diagnosis quicker so I can spend my time helping the patient understand to have confidence that we know what we're doing and give them an idea of what's going to happen for them in the future and what those options are. So that really is what makes the difference. If I'm, if I can get to the answer quicker, I can spend my time on doing those things which are really human in that interaction that matter. And I think that's where the real potential exists. Um, there's an, there are other groups that um, are using technology to replace uh, hospital visits in pregnancy. And I know I've been involved in discussions of the equity, and we need to keep that in mind. We need to uh, use the at home to increase access and not have access to a physician a luxury as opposed to uh, at home care. So that equity has got to be part of our goal. This is for the panel. I, I'm wondering, is this really in 
enhancing the workflow. I hear Dr. Martins that he will spend more time on the patient, but is it that is going to be true or is going to be more patient to see? So we, we, how we are improving the, in, in a short range or in a short time, it's going to be a lot of information to <coughs> kind of communicate with the patient or a lot of information to understand. So it's really not at the short time, it's not improving the workflow. And thank you. Go ahead. Just uh, one quick comment. Uh, we need to incorporate this into the educational program. Physicians, when they're trained, um, have so many technical things to learn that they forget that the, their real value is being a human being and caring about their patients. And as we move to an era where the technical things can be taken over by machines, we have to move along the educational um, system to make sure that uh, trained uh, new trainees are uh, learn that me message and learn the skills that they need to show that they care. I also think we need to be prepared, prepared for massive paradigm shifts in what kind of data are we going to be taking when we go from collecting discrete data to continuous data, specifically speaking about the point of care, are we looking at blood pressure, are we looking at blood sugar, are we looking at cardiac events? Really, you know, blood sugar is A1C, really the right thing to be monitoring. We're going to get massive amounts of data. We're going to get it very quickly, and we're going to have to look at an overall picture of the whole patient, and we're going to have to change our metrics on what we're going to be monitoring. So I think that we need to be prepared for that, too, as we move forward. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, since, Dr. King, you have the podium, I want to, I mean, the uh, mic, I want to ask uh, you about this topic. Uh, it's... Uh, I want to see, since you talked about the uh, NIBIB as technology developers, I want to see what type of vision do you have in uh, the you know, overall guiding principles, uh, specifically when it comes to technologies that have an impact on the, you know, the diagnosis. And, uh, so anyway, go ahead. So what's very important for us is the data sets that are teaching these neural networks and, and guiding the AI and the imaging data for the last 50 years, a lot of it's going to have to be thrown out and we're starting over developing new imaging databases to train the neural networks with the correct resolution, the correct parameters we need. So part of this is the preclinical participation in large databases like the ACR database where you're developing imaging standards that you can collect over time and everyone can use these databases to train their neural networks. Um, that's one aspect. The second are panels like this with the patient perspective where I learned today that we're dealing with um, flexible transducers that can be applied to the skin, do continuous monitoring or implantable devices. And we're learning here from patients what's important is the adhesive applying the transducer to the body and how sensitive their skin and how they interact with our technology and how important that can be in the preclinical research side, when you're developing the technology, the patient's interaction with that technology is just as important as developing the technology. Because if a patient can't use it, it won't be used. Okay. Dr. Shabbos, thank you. To add on to this, is a, uh, my job is to look at the application. And uh, I look at usually for the killer application. I call the AI guided application as a killer application. We talked a lot about the ultrasound here. But there's other modality that they can really take advantage of this. To get the AI at well trained, you need a good data. It does not matter which hospital it comes from. And there's a major factor that the operator, how they take the images. The same machine, uh, the same procedure, we'd have a different images because of the operators. So if you can get AI guided, this would be really beneficial. I would like to add uh, three more points. Um, first of all, I mean, uh, if, it'd be great um, if we first have high performance algorithms. <laughs> if we, well, I mean, if we have high performance algorithms, then we can both optimize for, you know, true positive and true negatives. That's the first step. Um, but, you know, reality is often more uh, uglier than, you know, the ideal. So uh, that goes to my second point, which is now um, FDA now have total product life cycle um, approach um, for se uh, software as medical device, which is really exciting. Um, in that framework, uh, we can propose some, you know, pre-specified, you know, um, change control plans. And in that, according to plan, based on some agreed upon plan uh, between the device manufacturer and um, third party review, or in this case, the FDA, um, depending on the uh, clinical situations or depending on the sites, um, 
the user of the technology can titrate between the, the specificity and the sensitivity. Um, that can be one exciting future uh, direction. The third point is that, you know, uh, it's simple. Uh, Post-market surveillance will be very important. Um, I just want to go back to one of my slides, which is garbage in, garbage out. You know, principle number one that we're taught right away in medical school because um, in terms of figuring out the false positives, the false negatives, the true positives, true... Everything starts with acquiring precise, beautiful data, which ties back into we need algorithms to do that. And we have tons of help for that. We have, you know, Jean's here with the Perinatal Quality Foundation, and that's their focus. We heard a talk about Kiba yesterday, and that's their focus. I, I think we have a lot of room to work together toward that. Dr. Frank. And to answer the question as I understand it, as it's written, um, the, if the impact of image acquisition AI on false positives and false negatives is manifest principally in diagnostic quality of the image. Yeah? Uh, I think one of the speakers yesterday referred to the desire to have world-class uh, diagnostic quality irrespective of sight, right? So there's this concept that the AI can make an expert of a novice uh, in the acquisition. And I think people should understand that that Making an expert of a novice is more than just getting the diagnostic quality. It's also optimizing other things, reducing scan time, reducing the administered dose, uh, and so on, and thereby other benefits as well, such as reduced need for repeat scanning, which is a savings uh, as well. So this notion of reducing false negatives and false positives derives from image quality, but there are other benefits as well to that acquisition AI. And other things need to be taken. Oh, sorry. I'm ad living again. Um, and other things need to be taken into consideration, as was pointed out yesterday and by Dr. Frank right now. For instance, what what's in the person's external environment? What else is going on in their internal environment? It's not just imaging, although everything starts with that good image. Dr. Sami, you read my mind. I was going to come to you that, okay, now come, let's come to the reality. And uh, how would uh, recalls, uh, how should uh, recalls be handled for uh, AI-guided uh, image acquisition systems? Thanks for the, the question, and I'll, I'll, I'll integrate the answer with the comment I was going to make. They sort of fit together. Um, I think... <clears throat> One of the things that we're seeing um, is in, in the field of ultrasound in particular is not only the availability of algorithms, but also the wide deployment of sensing. Uh, handheld or sub-handheld devices are common. There are multiple papers appearing for patch-based ultrasound devices as well. Some of these devices don't even do imaging. They just do sensing of physiologic parameters and um, on-chip processing of related um, signals. And the transition there is one in which imaging or sensing was being performed in a doctor's office or at a hospital and is now being deployed out into the community. You see this with uh, the Apple Watch, which many of you probably are wearing. And you're seeing this with ultrasound right now. Ultrasound is was a cart and it's cell phone, then it's going to be watch-sized very soon. In fact, uh, the latest cell phones for fingerprint recognition use ultrasound for fingerprint recognition. Right? And that's important because it, it, it provides a huge opportunity and a huge risk. Um, when you look at the real big ticket items that have changed patient outcomes, they actually haven't really been medical care. They've been public policy. Um, you know, seatbelts save more people than all the trauma care in the United States. The reduction in air pollution from air pollution regulations reduced cancer more than all chemotherapy for all cancers combined. <clears throat> and the reason is when you take a small nudge, a small change, and you deploy it widely across the whole community, and you push everyone's risk a little to the left, you have an enormous impact on health outcomes. 
And what we're seeing with widely deployed sensing is that sensing is moving from being a medical tool to being a policy tool, a public health tool. And that is going to fundamentally change the way healthcare is delivered. This idea of detecting something, some signal, you're, a, you're too obese, your body wall thickness is too large, or you have X or you have Y, and you need to see a doctor is going to fundamentally, paradigmatically change how we need to approach those signals. And I think that that question is going to be one that will be resolved not so much by medical imaging companies, it's going to be resolved by public policy and by the formation of new organizations to deal with those signals and positively affect the health and outcomes of the community. Great, thank you. Dr. Hong. So by recalls, um, did you mean uh, patient, recalling the patient for re-image re-acquisition? By recalls, did you mean uh, getting the patient again for image reacquisition? Giving the patient back for yes. additional imaging. Yeah, so recall, yeah, in that sense, recall is bad. But um, I think that the badness can depend on the situations. So in clinical settings where, you know, getting images used to be impossible, and now AI guided, you know, image acquisition technology enabling um, more in, um, image acquisitions that were previously un uh, impossible. I think that in that case, um, you know, benefits would far outweigh uh, risks. So in that case, you know, some recalls may be okay because, you know, otherwise. But in other, um, and I also can see some benefits of using um, AI guided image acquisition, you know, technology helping or establish the settings. So for example, if you take a, take a look at, you know, cardiac ultrasound image acquisition echo lab, they typically scan hundreds of echoes in some cases, and it is it is not impossible even for highly trained professionals to f forget a few views or a few measurements. And you know, these new technology can quietly look at the images in the background and can send you know notifications alerting them, hey, you know, you need to scan these views and you know make sure so that we can minimize the recalls. So I think there's a benefit in two different situations. I don't, I don't want us to lose track of the fact that we're very fortunate in this room and almost everyone listening to have access to medical imaging. And so two thirds of the world right now has no access to medical imaging at all, none. And so when you talk about things that can have dramatic impact across the world, a maternal fetal medicine, every 90 seconds a woman dies as complications of childbirth around the world, that can instantly change with access to medical imaging. And so part of the promise of this group here and thinking about it, developing these tools are not necessarily the nuance of high-end systems here, but where that can lower the cost of care, accelerate the deployment of these devices around the world where they've been waiting for this stuff to get there. They've got cell phones but they don't have medical imaging. And so where we can take technology there today, we will have a huge pack, impact on world health. Great, thank you. Um, I need to move to the next topic, a very short time left, uh, from diagnosis to uh, treatment, uh, interventional procedures. And uh, with that, I wanna go to our representatives of uh, device developers in this space. Uh, uh, Dr. Trams and Dr. Washburn, please, your thoughts on uh, your uh, AI-guided uh, image acquisition systems in interventional procedures. Okay, um, thank you. Um, I think this has been discussed in a number of ways uh, over this workshop yesterday, and I think it, um, again, I'll, I'll stress that this is not uh, unique to AI. We, we incorporate new technologies all the time. Uh, to allow for, in, in terms of interventional procedures or using AI-based techniques or other types of technologies in medical devices, I think would be defined in the documentation and covered in training. Uh, An ultimate control still resides with the clinician and the physician, right? And so it's really another tool in the toolbox that allows for making that, you know, effective decision, uh, control, uh, decision support. Yeah, from that perspective of it being another tool in the toolbox, that's certainly true. And the, and the hope is that the original tool in the toolbox, being the physician, is still very engaged, right? And that the technology plus the physician provides some additional level of ability 
um, that wouldn't be there without the combination of the two. Uh, over time, of course, um, as some of these assistive technologies uh, get better, maybe they can take on more of the task um, and become more uh, autonomous um, over time. But I don't, certainly don't think that's where it begins. And I would just supplement that with the additional comment that Yes, the physician is always in control, and this really is assistive technology, but there's always provision for a fallback to a manual, fully manual operation as well. It's never predicated the reliance on the AI. Great, thank you. Go ahead. I do, I do a lot of uh, interventional radiology, and I've watched a lot of, and I've QA'd a lot of it. Um, so we have guidance devices, and we're comfortable with the systems that tell us information about the procedure, but oftentimes it's uh, how to direct the needle. Are you hitting the target? Uh, not that there's an organ there that you missed that you're uh, too close to. I've seen several patients die from interventional procedures where they did an ablation, but it was too close to bowel. Uh, bowel is hard to identify sometimes when it's collapsed and uh, perforated the bowel. The person, people died of sepsis. So there are a lot, there's a lot of room for additional um, information in these uh, guidance devices to alert us when uh, we're doing something uh, and there's something that's wrong with it that we shouldn't be doing. Great, thank you. Um, again, I'm afraid that I'm, uh, I have to uh, go through these uh, slides quickly. Topic six about, is about uh, transparency and uh, knowing perhaps uh, what's behind the uh, scenes for AI. And I think we have uh, talked about that. Uh, we have heard from our patient representatives that uh, some level of uh, information is good. If it's too much, too much clutter, perhaps that's not good. Uh, so let's move on uh, to the uh, next topic is the Alara, as low as reasonably achievable. Um, so, uh, Perhaps, uh, you know, this is, of course, extremely important in fetal imaging. So, Dr. Feltovich, if you have, uh, if you could please get us started. So, the principle of ALARA, which is as low as reasonably acceptable, of course, is critical, especially for developing tissues like the fetus. And I think that, you know, to go back to what I said about that, um, I, I think that we can rely on organizations that are already established, for instance, Kiva PQF, organizations like this to work with industry and work with physicians to get just enough information, not too little, not too much, but just enough to regulate that. Great, thank you. Dr. Samir. So I think um, it's important to have a historic and physics-based perspective on these issues to some extent. Um, when you look at existing changes like the widespread use of harmonic imaging and ultrasound, you know, that increased deposited energy by probably a factor of around 10. And uh, we didn't even notice, right? We just all went okay and kept using the tools. So. Um, yes, I think it is important, and it's important to monitor energy deposition. Uh, but the evidence, at least for ultrasound, that one will be likely to cause harm that is in any way greater than the clinical harm you can cause through overdiagnosis is presently lacking, and I think probably not that likely. Great, thank you. And uh, let's move on to the last topic. Uh, this is uh, something that was brought up by Ms. Spitz in uh, her talk, Art versus Science. Could that last minuscule maneuver of the probe make a big difference in the image information content without affecting the image quality? How could we manage the lack of the art in the science of scanning? Jean, if you could please share your thoughts with us. Um, well, as I say, sonographers have their own eye, their own sense of style, their own idea of what's a good image. That may come from where they practice, that may come from where they're trained, that may come from the physicians they work with, but it's hard to change that. And sometimes it's disruptive in terms of the purpose of the image. Um, and so, um, you know, we just, we need more examples of good images out there so that they, they're they not in their own little world with respect 
to what looks good. There's so many times I hear, but my doctor likes it and it's horrible. So we, we need a bigger per perception of quality. And I think that's AI can give us that. Thank you. Any other thoughts before we break for lunch, Dr. Hong? So precisely because of that reason, I think that it is very important to, uh, to have a system and all the acquired images get reviewed by experts professional you know, clinicians. Um, and I think that um, science is a, a branch of art. <laughs> just wanted to okay. say that. Thank you. Go ahead. So I just uh, uh, really appreciated Dr. Felovich's uh, picture of the, of the baby moving around, babies moving around and the, the challenges of actually getting to the right views, etc. I think that we've been working to solve this problem uh, in terms of standardization uh, for a long time. And I think protocols have been, you know, kind of helping to get the, the right views at the right time and make sure we don't forget certain things. The image quality side of it is, I think, where AI can help in terms of kind of enhancing protocols with an AI element that can actually provide that quality feedback to the user of whether it's good or not good enough. So. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Yes, with that, I just want to thank you uh, for uh, being available to as a panel member here and sharing your thoughts. Thank the audience for uh, this uh, session, for being patient, and uh, apologize for running late. And uh, after lunch, we'll uh, come back and discuss uh, other topics, specifically regulation. Okay, thank you. Thank you.